Thanks for hanging with us here on Aggie Sports Overtime. If you ever see any women's basketball coach Gary Blair out in public, there's a good chance you'll see him wearing his 2011 National Championship ring. It is a thing of beauty, and it's been a staple of his wardrobe for the last decade. Heck, I'd wear one, right? I would wear a National Championship ring every day of my life if I had one, too. On Sunday, A&M will honor that 2011 team that won it all during halftime of the game against Georgia. Earlier this week, I caught up with six members of that special squad to reminisce about their championship season. We are now joined by six members of the national championship Texas A&M women's basketball team. They'll be honored tomorrow during halftime of the game against Georgia, but we appreciate you guys for taking a few minutes out of your busy schedules to talk about that magical run back in 2011. So I want to start with this. this what, does one memory from that run stick out above the rest 10 years later now? I would say... Not only just winning that game, but I would say after each game or even practice, I think majority of us went to Steak and Shake. And I think, Chrissy, you you and I can really attest to this one. <laughs> um, we would always go right after the game. I think that that was just kind of like a way to, um, I don't know, just pretty much no, we did. We we're preparing for the next day, but also like treat ourselves like we deserve to be here. So let let us take that and really just celebrate the moment, live in the moment. Speaking of that memory seat. So what I remember from that is we went to Steak and Shake, but didn't tell the coaches. <laughs> and <laughs> we ended up having like the best <laughs> practice of our lives, like as a unit. And, and Coach Schaefer was like, you know, that was the best practice. What y'all do? We were like, Oh, we went to Steak and Shake. And remember, they bust us. Remember that? After practice, they bust us to Steak and Shake. Because they were like, well, if, if that's how y'all are going to practice, you might as well take y'all back to Steak and Shake. And it well, just became like the place that we would go to for lunch and dinner. I think m most memorable for me when the confetti dropped and it wasn't our colors. Like, most people are probably like thinking of like a happy memory, but I was like, they were really, people were shady toward us, like really for a lot of that trip. And it was just like, a vibe you pick up on. It wasn't necessarily word said or anything, but it was just like, a, we didn't really want y'all to be here. We wanted Baylor to be here. So we just like had a chip on our shoulder about every every little thing. I think sometimes I was even just searching for stuff. I was like, oh, you didn't say, hey? Bet, so you don't think that we should, you don't think we should be here? We're not gonna win? So for me, it was, it was the confetti falling and it was Notre Dame's colors instead of, instead of maroon. I really remember about that season and about that weekend was, Every time we got ready to break a huddle or celebrate something, talking about throw up the dub, put it on the west, like every, like I think there's even some pictures of us just throwing up W bad as after a game, <laughs> and it was just always west yeah. side or H town. I just remember, I mean, we knew where we were or whatever it was, but I guess it was kind of surreal and just trying to make sure we was ready for our little minutes whenever we got in and contribute, especially. <laughs> As a freshman, I remember like stretching and stuff, and then I'm looking, I'm like, all right, Chris, we here, girl, we made it. <laughs> when you guys look back, it's been 10 years since that run. When did you know you guys were a national championship caliber team? I, for me, it was when we played Rutgers in New York. And I remember we uh, whooped their butt. I'm going to say something else, but... Um, we, I was in the concourse afterwards and a Rutgers fan, an old school guy, he came up to me and he was like, man, y'all whooped our girls. Who are y'all? And when he said that, I was, I just looked at him in disgust, like, like, what do you mean? Who are we? And that, I think that was the first time I was like, one, y'all aren't the same Rutgers that she used to be. But two, I was like, this team is good. Like, and that was the first time I, like, I was kind of, like, confronted with someone, like, doubting us, like, well, who are y'all? And I'm like, as a freshman, I'm coming in, like, do you not see all the talent on the team? Like, we're about to be somebody, and sure enough, it happened. Mood all season. That's what it was. That's right. What, it was. <laughs> what you mean? I feel like there was a confidence. I obviously, I don't think any of us would, would <laughs> think or say that we were arrogant um, until someone starts doubting us, then we probably got a little cocky, but... 
Um, I think it was just a general confidence and an understanding that there really wasn't a whole lot of resistance from within. We were all kind of pulling in the same direction. And as cliche as that sounds, I think the reality is at the end of the day or at the end of the season, it was evident that um, we carried ourselves with confidence because we ultimately knew where we all stood and what we were all trying to do. Going into it starting summer, really, summer school, it was like, all right, we're not playing around. Y'all really only got a week off and then we're going back to summer workouts. Like it kind of started there. And I think Jen can attest to that. I felt like it was a plan. Like those workouts were just getting a lot more difficult. And then um, I think you could just tell the agenda was we didn't end how we wanted to. So we're about to kick it up a notch. And I think everybody was just on the same page. That summer, I think it was most important that it was a decision that we all made that we were going to be around because we didn't necessarily have to stay. People could have left, like, sure, there could have been consequences for something, but you didn't have to be there. But it was the fact that we all, we knew it was going to be hard, but we knew that we needed to do something different to have our season go differently than it had in the past. In the national championship game, you guys are playing Notre Dame. Daniel Adams goes off in the second half. At, at what moment during that game did it finally sink in for you guys to be like, holy crap, we just did this? When Tyra White hit that three on the out of bounds play. I'll end with this then. Uh, coach Blair is one of my favorite coaches I've had a chance to cover. So I, I got to ask a two part question. Who taught him how to Dougie? And then two, oh. can you share Coach Blair's story with me, please? Because the more Gary Blair stories I hear, the better. Nobody properly taught him how to Dougie. <laughs> right. I don't, yeah, I, I think he just watched. <laughs> He just told him that. He just told him that. Like, it's so funny. I think if this had this been had that been like a time when Twitter and Instagram, like, think, social media was bigger, it would have been around way more. It was already on ESPN. Like every morning, it was like the thing, the picture you're seeing because it was like us who won and the Mavs, or whatever. So you're seeing like all the championship teams, and he's dug in. I think it was me and Sid maybe who were like. Coach, like, do the Dougie. It had to be because it wouldn't have been anybody else. <laughs> it, it, it was, y'all. And it was on, it was on World Star Hip Hop. Like Coach Blair, <laughs> like, just the way he talks, I think the the time it takes, you know, for us to, <laughs> to get the message, to, to listen to what he's trying to tell us. I mean, this man can tell stories for hours if you were to just let him keep talking.